What? Do you expect me to say something? I mean, it is, after all, Easter Sunday, right? Did you catch the final words of Mark's Gospel today? They said nothing to anyone because of what? Do we need to read it again? Yeah, do we need to read it again? They saw the empty tomb. They, they heard the angelic announcement. The stone was rolled away. There is an angel in bright and radiant light sitting there on top of the stone that had sealed the tomb. We read earlier today at our sunrise service that the soldiers who had guarded the tomb, these battle hardened men. They saw the resurrected Christ and they fell down as the Bible says, the old King James Version, they fell down as though they were dead men. They passed out cold. Think about that. These guys had been trained in brutality and warfare. They faced death as part of their career. They had taken life. They had battled mano e mano, one on one. Not like today. You know, hey, don't get me wrong. I give all credit to those who served in our armed forces. You know, thank you, thank you, and thank you for keeping this nation safe and free and protected. But think of it today. You can push a button, a rocket flies, it explodes. You watch it on a screen. Not so in the day of Christ. These men faced their opponent face to face. There he was right in front of you, and he wants to kill you. These guys had seen it all. And yet when they saw the resurrected Christ, they passed out cold. Now think about this. Think about this. Who were these men? If we go back through the passion account of Jesus, Jesus is betrayed. He is arrested. He is taken before the Sanhedrin. There they condemn him. He is then taken before Pontius Pilate. You know the back and forth that goes on between Pilate and the crowd, even the conversation that he has tries to have with Jesus Christ. Finally, Pilate condemns Jesus. And what happens? The Roman soldiers, they grab Jesus. They take him into the praetorium, the barracks area where all the soldiers are. And the Bible tells us that the whole battalion, everybody, all those Roman soldiers there, they come out and they mock and they beat and they brutalize Jesus Christ. They put that crown of thorns down upon his head. They take this ragged purple robe and they throw it upon his battered and bruised body. They spit upon him and they mock him. They, they take the reed that they put in his hand as a scepter and they beat him with it. And then they carry him, make him carry his own cross to Calvary's hill and then they hammer nails through his sacred hands and feet. And while Christ is hanging in agony there on the cross, what does he say? You wait until you meet my dad. <laughs> Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Think of that, my friends. These same men who have beaten and brutalized Christ, Christ prays for them, and he prays forgiveness and love upon them. Think about that in your own life. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, but maybe you've got a sin in your life that you struggle with. Does God forgive me? Has God truly washed away all of my sins? When I stand before God on the judgment day, is there that one thing that might keep me out of paradise? How will I explain? What excuse will I give for having committed this sin and this offense and trespass against Almighty God? How embarrassing, how humiliating when God opens that golden book with all of our names printed there inside and he's going to read all of the evil and, and sinful things that we've done in our life, all those skeletons that we've so carefully kept in our closet. Nobody knows We've carried that burden of guilt and shame for years, maybe even decades. 
now all of creation will know because all of creation on the judgment day will be gathered there before God and he will look and he will read and everybody will know just how wicked we are, correct? No, thank you, no. Concentrate emphatically on the words of John in John, 1 John chapter 1. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away all sin. Not just some sin, not maybe sin, not occasional sin, not small sin. It doesn't matter what you have done. If you have gone to God in heartfelt confession, if you have gone to God in heartfelt repentance, God forgives that sin. Behold, says God, I will cast away your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I will remember it no more. God not only has perfect forgiveness, he has perfect forgetfulness as well. When you and I stand before the throne of God, we don't even have to say a word because Christ Jesus, because of his victory over death in the grave, he is our advocate. He is our mediator. There he will be standing right next to us when we go before God on the judgment day. God, Jesus will look at God and he will say, this one is mine. This one belongs to me. This is the one that I died for. Think about this. Read John chapter 17 this afternoon. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. What chapter out of John are you going to read today? 17, that's called the high priestly prayer. Jesus is facing his agony, his crucifixion. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Great drops of sweat are pouring from his head. Drops of blood... And he's thinking of you. He's thinking of you individually, by name. Read John chapter 17. I pray not only for these, the disciples who are snoozing in the garden. Is anybody snoozing right now? A little bit of nervous laughter, right? Yeah. They'd gone to sleep. Jesus prays for them and then he prays for you. John chapter 17. I want you to read it. And he's there on the cross suffering and dying. He's thinking about you. When he cries out, I thirst, he's revealing his humanity to you. He knows what it's like. He knows pain. He knows grief. He knows sorrow. He knows suffering. You're not alone. When hard times come, when difficult days come down the pike, when you're struggling and you're wondering, God, where are you? He's on the cross, knowing your pain. I guarantee you, friends, if you're like me, how many of you are old like me? <laughs> what I've noticed, you know, as I go along in life, when I was a young man and troubles and trials would come, you know, God, God, where are you right now? I've dedicated my life to you. I read my Bible. I say my prayers. I do my devotion. I sing the hymns. God, where are you? What have I done wrong? Why do I deserve this? And then I look back, I get through that dark time in my life, and I look back, and you know what I discovered? God was walking with me every step of the way. Maybe it's not a path or a journey that I would have chosen, but God chose that path and that journey for me to show me his love, to show me his mercy, to show me his grace. And I look back, and all I can say is, thank you, God. And the more that happens, the more confident I am about my future. I know where I'm going, and I know where I will be. What does the Apostle Paul say? If Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain, and we are to be pitied more than all men, says the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. If you and I were to say that in common language, in everyday language, what would we say? If Christ is not raised, then I have nothing to preach about, and you have nothing to believe. You know, it occurred to me this week, as I was thinking about this Easter Sunday, I, this is my, uh, what, 30, 30, 34th Easter Sunday. 
34 Easter Sundays, I proclaim Christ is risen. He is risen in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, talk about the empty tomb, the empty grave, the resurrected Christ, our eternity in heaven. It never gets old, does it? It shouldn't. And I don't mean that judgmentally. That was a bad way to say it. It should not. But it occurred to me this week, if you take Buddha out of Buddhism, you still have Buddhism by another name. It's advice on living. It's a moral code. If you take Muhammad out of Islam, you still have Islam. A list of rules and regulations and maybe some historical context. But if you take Christ out of Christianity, you have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. I've heard it my whole life. I've heard it for 60 years now, 60 big years. You know, oh, all religions are the same. It wasn't long ago I was talking to an individual. He came over to inspect my house so that I could qualify for insurance. I've gone with citizens, by the way. How many of you are part of the happy crowd with citizens right now? Yeah. He's out there, he's taking pictures of my roof and going around the house and looking at my electrical box and we started talking, we started talking religion. Really nice guy, he was a really friendly nice guy. We had a great conversation and he tells me, you know what, I think that as long as you're good, you'll go to heaven. True or false? Totally and completely false. All our works are as filthy rags, says the Bible. No matter how good you are, you are not good enough to inherit eternal life. That is what the Bible is all about. All other religions in the world, you work your way toward paradise. You know, remember the guys that flew the planes into the World uh, Trade Center towers? Remember, remember that horrible day? What would motivate them to do such a terrible and horrible thing? They truly believed that by giving their life, Allah, who was a false god, I want to be real clear about that, Allah would reward them with an eternity in paradise with 72 pieces of grapes. Did, did you know that? That's actually a mistranslation. Yeah, the 72 virgin thing. Oops, we read that one wrong. <laughs> you know, if that were true, imagine their disappointment. They get up there, here's your tray of grapes. <laughs> really? Really? Wow. They thought they would earn their paradise. You take the Vikings, okay? Remember that, Kirk Douglas, the movie The Vikings? And if you die in battle, you go to all Valhalla, the, the hall of the slain. You get this special place with all of these special things. You earn your place in their version of heaven. That is man's corruption of eternal life. The key difference between Christianity and all other religions in the world, Christ has earned for us heaven forgiveness, and eternal life with God. He gives it to us as a free gift. Read this afternoon, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'll say it again, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Is God's forgiveness free? No. No, it is not. There's the price that God paid. There's the price that God paid for our eternity. It's free to us, but it wasn't free to God. That, my friends, is the great love of God for you, that he would sacrifice his own son. How many of you would sacrifice your child, your grandchild, maybe a niece or a nephew or a child that lives in your neighborhood, someone that you know, you love, you admire them, you care? Would you, would you give that child for an evil and wicked person? None of us would. And yet God did. Note the words of the Apostle Paul, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
people will look at the Old Testament and they'll deny God and they'll ridicule God. They'll say, how can you believe in a God where all of these horrible things happened? Wars and mayhem and murder and strife. How, you know, look at the Old Testament. You know what the Old Testament does? It shows us man's need for a Savior. Man's need for a Savior. That's the purpose of the Old Testament, to point to the coming Christ, the coming Messiah. God is not approving of all those things. You want to read about the, the degenerateness of humankind? Read the book of Judges. It gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. Why? Because man needs salvation. Man needs eternal life. There's only one way to heaven. A lot of people, well, you know what? There's so many roads, as long as you're good, as long as you're sincere you'll get to heaven. There are many paths to heaven. No, not according to what we believe, not according to the Word of God. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, no man cometh unto the Father except through me. Okay, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Let's do that right now. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Caught you off guard, didn't I? See how easy it is for us to be like the women at the tomb? We tremble, we are afraid, we're shy, we're bashful. Let's try it one more time with feeling as though we're good Missouri Synod Lutherans with an opinion. Okay? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus, is my Savior. Jesus, went Jesus went to the cross for me. Because of the righteous blood of Jesus Christ, I will be in heaven for all eternity. And it's all because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Hallelujah. One thing that I really want to impress upon you today. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the, the empty tomb, the stone rolled away, the soldiers who trembled at the resurrected Christ, our salvation and our forgiveness. But right now we're at a at a very special time on Easter Sunday, all of our loved ones who have confessed Jesus Christ are with Christ now. They believed. They placed their trust, their hope, their faith in Jesus Christ. And when they died, Christ took them to be in paradise. What do we say at so many funerals? Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We're going to celebrate communion. I pointed this out a number of times, and I never, I never get tired of pointing this out. Oftentimes, when a loved one passes away, we think of them looking down on us from heaven. I remember when my dad was an old, old man. My father died, he was 97 years old. And he told me one time, we were sitting out in the shed at his house. And he tells me, you know, when I die, I'm going to be looking, I'm going to get choked up. I'm going to be looking down from heaven and watching you preach the word of God. It's a cool thought, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lie. I get choked up when I think, but you know what? Dad isn't watching me right now. My father's enjoying heaven because if he's watching me preach the word of God right now, then he's watching me in the bathroom on, say, a Monday morning. 
Yeah, and nobody's watching me. How uncomfortable is that, right? Yeah, you never think about that. You know, you're rocking in grandma's chair. Oh, grandma's watching me from heaven, rocking in her chair, or, or sewing on the sewing machine I inherited, or cooking with the skillet that she gave me before she passed. Well, then grandma's watching you all the time, and sometimes that can be just downright embarrassing, right? Just kind of awkward, okay? The only time we gather together with the saints in paradise is here at the communion rail. Just a few short moments, we're going to be celebrating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The church militant, us, is going to be united with the church triumphant, those in paradise, even as we have said so many times in the communion liturgy, therefore with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven. I want you to think about that today. On this Easter Sunday, when you come forward to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, naturally you want to think about your sins forgiven. Before you come forward, you want to go to God in heartfelt and honest conversation and confess those sins to him, whatever those sins might be. Come forward realizing that all those sins will be washed away and cleansed and forgotten by the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. But when you receive that wafer and when you drink that blood of Christ, that wine, think of your loved ones in paradise. Think of those people that you have loved and lost. I hate that expression. Lost. I know where they are. They're not lost. No, we lose the clicky for the television, don't we? We lose our car keys. We lose the lighter for our cigarette. We lose our glasses. Is anybody like me? If you take your glasses off and lay them down and forget where you put them, you can't find them because you can't see? That's me. Yeah, you all are just a blur to me right now. Those are the things we lose. But I haven't lost anybody that I love. I know right where they are. They're with Christ. They're with Jesus. They're with all the company of heaven. Think on that today. Think of the joy that they're experiencing. Think of the happiness, the profound happiness that they have right now. If they died of some sickness, some disease, if they died in pain, if they died, their bodies were ravaged. Think of the glorified, beautiful bodies that they have right now. Remember when Jesus came out of the tomb? His beautiful body, even though he had been beaten and brutalized on the cross? Think of the existence they have now. No pain, no tears, no trial, no heartache, no worry, no fear. Think on these things. And it's all because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The